Ну, а мы переходим к блоку Keynote Talks. We are going to Keynote Talks section, and the head of the Graph Deep Learning of Twitter company, the professor of Imperial College of London, Michael Bronstein, is going to open that section. He founded a fabulous AI startup that was acquired by one of the largest social media in the world, Twitter. The main technologies was used that was used was geometrical deep learning. It is used by Twitter to fight with fake news. Today, Michael will talk about the geometrical Mikhail, hello, do you hear us? We are, yes, I well, can hear well. we are waiting for your presentation. Thank you very much. So thanks uh, for your introduction and the great pleasure to be here, even though only virtually. So I would like to talk about today about geometric deep learning. And for this purpose, let me maybe go back in history. And uh, it's fair to say that for nearly 2000 years, uh, the word geometry was synonymous with Euclidean geometry, simply because no other types of geometry existed. And this Euclid's monopoly came to an end in the 19th century, when Lobachevsky, Boyer, Gauss, uh, Riemann, and others constructed the first examples of what we now call non-Euclidean geometries. And together with the development of other geometries, it created an entire zoo of different uh, geometric uh, properties towards the end of that century. And mathematicians uh, didn't understand and debated which geometry is the true one and what actually defines a geometry. So the way out of this uh, pickle was shown by a young German mathematician called Felix Klein. He was appointed in 1872 as a professor in the University of Erlangen in Bavaria. And uh, in a research paper that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, Klein proposed approaching geometry as the study of invariance or symmetries, or the properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations that he formalized using the language of group theory. So the impact of the Erlangen program on geometry and mathematics in general was very profound. It also spilled to other fields, in particular physics, where symmetry considerations allowed to derive uh, fundamental conservation laws from first principles. And uh, it took several decades until these, uh, these ideas, through the notion of what is called gauge invariance, proved successful in unifying all the fundamental forces of nature, maybe with the exception of gravity. And this is what is called the standard model, and it describes uh, almost all the physics we currently know. So I can only repeat the words of a Nobel winning physicist, Philip Anderson, that it is only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, you may wonder at this point, what does it all have to do with deep learning? And uh, I think that on the one hand, Obviously, I don't need to convince you in this conference that uh, deep learning has brought uh, a true revolution in data science and made possible many tasks that maybe uh, a decade ago would be considered nearly science fiction, whether it's uh, speech recognition, natural language translation, or more recently, protein folding. On the other hand, we now have uh, still a zoo of different neural network architectures for different kinds of data, but very few unifying principles. And as a consequence, it's difficult to understand the relations between different methods which inevitably leads to reinvention and uh, rebranding of the same concepts. So we need some form of unification in the spirit of the Erlangen program that we call a geometric deep learning. And it has uh, two purposes. First, uh, to provide a common mathematical framework to study and derive from first principles some of the most popular and successful neural network architectures. And second, to give a constructive procedure to build uh, future AI systems. So if you look at machine learning, at least in the simple setting, you can say that it's a glorified uh, function estimation problem, right? So we are given some unknown function and observations of its input on some uh, training set. And we try to find a function that fits well the training data and allow us to predict outputs on previously unseen inputs. So image classification is probably the most canonical and classical example in the domain of computer vision. And what happened in the past decade is the availability of large uh, high quality data sets such as ImageNet coincided with uh, appropriate computational resources, GPUs. And this has led to the design of rich function classes with at least theoretical capacity to interpolate such large data sets. And neural networks appear to be a suitable choice 
because as we know, they have the universal approximation property where we can approximate any continuous function to any desired uh, accuracy. The problem is that the setting of this problem in low dimension is very well understood. It has been studied in approximation theory over the past century, but uh, it is entirely different in high dimensions and the traditional uh, regular classes of functions, such as Lipschitz continuous functions, uh, will require an exponentially increasing number of samples with the growth of the dimensionality. We call this phenomenon the curse of dimensionality, and it's a kind of built-in problem and common plight of uh, uh, almost all machine learning problems in uh, the modern age. And this is perhaps best seen in computer vision problems like uh, uh, image classification, where even tiny images tend to be very high dimensional, but intuitively they have a lot of structure. And if we just treat them as uh, high dimensional vectors and pass them into uh, uh, the expressive tron like neural networks, uh, we'll need to, uh, to show a lot of examples to the neural network to learn, for example, uh, invariance to trans to translations. Uh, and this is a technique that is called data augmentation, and it is uh, very wasteful. Now, the remedy to this problem in computer vision came from uh, classical works in neuroscience that showed that brain neurons are organized into local receptive fields with shared weights. And the first uh, example of such new kinds of uh, neural network architectures uh, was the uh, neocognitron uh, um, uh, architecture of Fukushima, and uh, of course the classical work of Jan Lecano and Kohlsers, the convolutional neural networks, are now widely used. So here is uh, another example. What you see here is a representation of a molecule as a graph. So the nodes here represent atoms and the edges represent chemical bonds. And uh, if you were to apply a neural network to this input, to predict some properties of this molecule, let's say it's binding energy, and this is a, a, a very common problem, for example, in drug discovery and design. Now we need to deal with the situation that we don't have a canonical ordering of the nodes of the graph, like we might have had in the case of images. And uh, this requires a completely different uh, type of architectures. And molecules are just one example of data with irregular non-Euclidean structure. Uh, other examples include social networks. These are gigantic graphs with billions of nodes and edges, uh, different kinds of interactons or interaction networks uh, in biological sciences, manifolds and meshes, which are graphs on steroids in some sense that are used in computer vision and graphics to model 3D objects, and so on and so forth. So if we look again at this um, uh, hopeless multi-dimensional image classification example because of the curse of dimensionality, we actually do have additional structure and it comes from the geometry of the input signal. We call this structure a geometric prior and uh, as I hope to show you, it is a general powerful principle that gives us hope and optimism in these dimensionality curse problems. And in our example of images, the input image is not just a multidimensional vector, it's uh, a signal that is defined on some geometric domain. And on this domain, we can describe its structure using its uh, symmetry group, so the group of translations, which act through a group representation. In this case, it's the translation operator on images, on signals on this domain. And we can incorporate the structure of this prior into the functions that have been applied to, to images and we can have functions that are invariant to the group action, and probably the best uh, example is image classification. So no matter where the object is located in the image, but we still want to say that this is, let's say, a cat. On the other hand, we can also have functions that are equivalent to the group action, so they change in the same way, and uh, image segmentation is also a good example. Uh, the uh, output, which is a pixel mask that segments the cat from the background, should be transformed in the same way as uh, the input. And uh, these principles give us a very general blueprint that we call geometric deep learning that you can recognize in the majority of popular deep neural architectures uh, that are used nowadays. We can apply a sequence of equivariant layers and possibly followed by an invariant global pooling layer. And in some cases also using a hierarchy of domains by some forcing procedure that takes the form of local pooling. And this is a very general design. We can apply it to different types of geometric structures, such as grids, uh, homogeneous spaces with uh, global transformation groups, graphs, and manifolds. And uh, we call this the 5G of geometric deployment. And the implementation of these principles in the form of inductive biases leads to some of the most popular architectures that exist nowadays in deep learning, whether it's convolutional networks that you can derive from the considerations of translational symmetry, graph neural networks, deep sets, and transformers, 
that stem from uh, permutational invariants and maybe some slightly more exotic architectures such as mesh and intrinsic CNNs that can be derived from uh, consideration of gauge symmetry. So if you look at graphs, uh, they are really ubiquitous and we can describe practically any system of relations and interactions as a graph uh, at all scales from nanoscales where you can model individual molecules to intermediate scales where you can model interactions between different uh, molecules in biological domains in particular, all the way to macroscopic scales where you can model uh, entire countries or even the entire world. And I'm talking about social networks. So social network is actually a good metaphor for a graph. So we can abstract the social network uh, where the users are modeled as nodes of a graph and their interactions as edges. And we can attach some feature vectors that model, for example, the demographic properties of users as uh, d-dimensional vectors associated with the nodes. So one uh, crucial uh, characteristic of graphs is that they don't have canonical uh, ordering of the nodes. So if we want to uh, represent the feature vectors and the structure of the graph as matrices, we need to take into account that they can be permuted in any uh, arbitrary way. And this permutation matrix is actually the representation of the permutation group. So that's the, the intrinsic symmetry of these kind of objects in our geometric deep learning blueprint. Now, if we want to implement a function of the graph that provides a single output for the entire graph, like in our example of predicting properties of molecules, we need to make sure that it is unaffected by the ordering of the nodes, or in other words, it is a permutation invariant function. If we want to do uh, node-wise predictions, for example, if I want to detect malicious users in a social network, I would like to make sure that, the, uh, in this case, the output of the function changes in the same way uh, as the input with the reordering of the nodes, or in other words, we are dealing with a permutation equivariant function. And if you look at typical graph neural network architectures, you will hopefully immediately recognize an instance of our general geometric deep learning blueprint, where the permutation group is our geometric prior, and we typically have a sequence of uh, permutation equivariant layers that are often called propagation or diffusion, uh, an optional global pooling layer to produce a single graph-wise uh, output, depending on the application. And also, some architectures include local pooling layers that are obtained using some form of graph processing that can also be learnable. And the core operation of a typical GNN architecture is local aggregation. So we look at the neighbors of each node in the graph. We collect their feature vectors together with the feature vector of the node itself and apply some aggregation function that I remind you because of the lack of canonical ordering must be permutation invariant. Now, when we apply this function at every node of the graph locally, we get an output that is permutation equivariant. And the choice of this aggregator is uh, crucial. And it was shown recently that if you choose an injective aggregator function, then graph neural network architectures are equivalent to what is called in graph theory, the, the Weistra lemon graph or isomorphism test that was derived by uh, two Russian mathematicians, Andrei Lemon and uh, Boris Weisfader uh, in the 1960s. So let me say a few words about some interesting special cases of graph neural networks. So in the first case, if we remove all the edges from the graph, we get a set, and sets share common properties of graphs in the sense that they're unordered. So in this case, the most straightforward approach would be to apply uh, an independent function at uh, every element of the set. And this architecture is known as uh, deep sets or, or point nets in the machine learning community. In another extreme case, we can assume that every element in the set can interact with any other element. And we can describe this as a complete or a fully connected graph. And I hope you can recognize in this case the famous transformer architecture that is now uh, uh, the staple of nature language processing applications, which is also a particular case of a graph neural network. Now, I should say that transformers are commonly used to analyze sequences, like sequences of text, where the order of nodes is actually given. And this node information is typically provided in the form of what is called positional encoding. So it's an additional feature that uniquely identifies the node. And uh, similar approaches exist for general graphs as well. There are multiple ways you can incorporate the positions of the nodes. And uh, one such uh, architecture was shown in our recent paper uh, that we call graph subtraction networks, where we count primitive graph substructures such as clicks or cycles. And uh, we can show that it can be made strictly more powerful than the vice relevant test by appropriate choice of these substructures. You can also consider it as a way of a problem-specific inductive bias 
for example, in molecular graphs, cycles are prominent structures, right? So in organic molecules, we have an abundance of, uh, abundance of for example, aromatic rings. So the same caffeine molecules has two rings of lengths uh, six and five. And what we observe in experiments is that our ability to predict chemical properties of molecules improves dramatically uh, by counting these primitive structures. Now, I should say, I mentioned convolutional networks uh, that uh, work on grids. So grids are obviously also a particular case of graphs. And uh, this is an example of a, a, a grid with periodic boundary conditions that is called a ring graph in graph theory. So compared to general graphs, the first thing that we notice on a grid is that it has a fixed neighborhood structure. So in this case, every node has exactly uh, two neighbors. Not only that, their ordering is fixed. So I remind you that on a general graph, we had this permutation invariant uh, aggregator function phi that was applied on a, a set of neighbors. But now we can actually order them so the function can be more specific. And if we choose the aggregation to be linear, we get exactly the convolution operation. That if we write it as a matrix, it has a very special structure that is called circular or toplitz matrix. Basically, it's a constant coefficients on the diagonals, and it can be obtained by cyclic shifts of a fixed spectrum of coefficients. So these are exactly the shared weights, the shared parameters that we've seen in uh, convolutional neural network architectures. So from algebraic standpoint, it's interesting that uh, um, circuit matrices are commutative with respect to multiplication. In particular, they commute with the shift operator that I mentioned in the beginning. And this is just another way of saying that circuit matrices uh, or convolutions are shift equivariant. So, and this property works in the other direction as well. So you can really define convolution as a linear operation that is shift equivariant. And you can see here the power of this geometric approach that convolution automatically emerges from translational symmetry. Now, you can, by virtue of this property, you can think of convolution as a kind of pattern matching operation that can be realized as a sliding window. Uh, operation in image processing. So to make it more formal, we can uh, define uh, a translation operator that we apply to our shift node here by psi, and an inner product that matches the filter to the image. And if we do it for every shift, we get the convolution or correlation, depending on, on, on how you define it. Now, there is a little bit of cheating here because uh, the translation group uh, can actually be identified with the domain itself. So I can describe every shift operator by a point to which I shift. And this is unfortunately not the general case. So in general case, we have some general group that acts on the image and the structure of the group. So the output of this group convolution doesn't need to be the same as uh, the domain itself. And it's probably best seen on a sphere where the sphere itself is a two-dimensional manifold. Uh, and uh, the group that we assume on it is uh, the special orthogonal group. So the group of translations that if you're familiar with uh, Lie groups, it's, uh, it can be Consider as a three-dimensional manifold. So the output here will have a different structure. And if I were to apply multiple layers of convolution on such domains, the second layer will need to be applied on this manifold of matrices on the special orthogonal group SO3. Now, uh, this example, uh, the domain here already is a non-Euclidean space. It's a manifold, as I said, but it's still quite special in the sense that there is total democracy on the sphere. So every point can be transformed into another point by a unique element of the symmetry group of rotations. And in geometry, we call such spaces homogeneous. And their key feature is this transitive uh, global structure of the group. So it takes a little bit of effort to generalize uh, these uh, constructions to general manifolds that are not necessarily, uh, uh, do not necessarily have this global structure. I apologize, something happened to my slides. <clears throat> just, just a second, please. Um, and uh, basically, in uh, in manifolds, uh, in general manifolds, we need to use a, a different uh, notion of invariance and equivariance that is called uh, that is called gauge invariance. And again, this is the same construction from uh, the domain of physics that uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, that was uh, crucial to the uh, construction of uh, modern uh, theories of uh, the universe. Uh, apologies for this uh, little technical hiccup. Um, so why manifolds are important? Uh, you may think of manifolds as a kind of exotic object that uh, maybe is alien to machine learning problems, but we actually encounter them uh, very often in computer vision and graphics, where, uh, 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 for example, applications like uh, motion capture, like I show in this video, 
uh, are widely used in uh, the movie industry, for example, to produce movies like uh, Avatar. And with uh, the help of geometric deep learning architectures, we can make these uh, approaches much simpler and uh, lightweight. So uh, in uh, our recent works, we showed actually uh, even more challenging hybrid architectures where the input can be a simple two-dimensional video that is transformed and encoded by a standard convolutional neural network. And the decoder is a special geometric mesh CNN that allows, for example, to very accurately reconstruct uh, hand shape and pose uh, faster than real time. So that was a collaboration with the British startup uh, called Real AI that was acquired last year by uh, Snap. And uh, this is now part of Snap products, uh, building three-dimensional avatars of, uh, of humans. I should say that uh, if there is one field that, in my opinion, is the most promising and the most exciting for uh, uh, geometric deep learning, it's the field of biology and drug design, and in particular, dealing with proteins. So as you know, proteins are biopolymers, so these are molecules that are cons consisted of a sequence or a chain of amino acids, and by the influence of uh, chemical and physical forces, they fold into structure that endow them with their function. So if you're familiar from your, maybe your childhood, of this snake toy, this is a good metaphor. Now, it was uh, postulated, one of the, the, uh, one of the challenges in, in protein science is to predict the three-dimensional three structure of a protein from uh, the sequence of amino acids. And it was postulated in the 70s that uh, the structure is entirely determined by the sequence. And uh, this field of structural biology has had its own uh, image at the moment. Uh, a couple of years ago, when AlphaFold, uh, developed by DeepMind, beat uh, by large margin all other architectures uh, that existed for the structure prediction. And nowadays, it's already almost as accurate as crystallography. So AlphaFold probably epitomizes uh, the success of geometric deep learning. So some of the, the key elements, what they call invariant point attention, is uh, essentially a graph neural network with equivariant message passing, that again, maybe in slightly more complex uh, manner uh, implements uh, the techniques that I showed here today. Now, it is interesting that uh, the inverse folding problem, so to say, is the problem of protein design, where we would like to construct a protein that has certain functions, and in particular, these functions are binding properties. So I want a protein molecule that fits uh, some target that is usually another protein as a key uh, fits a lock. And one application is oncological immunotherapy, where you try to develop a protein molecule that would uh, inhibit uh, a receptor. So in this particular case, it's called the program death uh, complex, the uh, PD-1, pd one uh, protein, protein that was recognized by the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018 uh, uh, for its role in the, uh, in the immunotherapy of cancer. So with the use of genetic deep learning architectures uh, in collaboration with my colleagues from, uh, from Switzerland, we were able to design uh, from scratch what is called de novo, uh, new proteins uh, that can bind uh, these and other oncological targets. So that was uh, a paper that appeared on the cover of Nature Matters last year. And in general, if you look at the field of uh, drug discovery and design, it's extremely challenging uh, historically because it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to, uh, uh, to find the right candidates that will fit the bill, so to say. And many of these uh, candidates drop at different phases of uh, uh, lab and clinical testing. So graph neural networks have been used recently to accelerate the discovery of uh, uh, new drugs. And probably, again, a successful application of this was an MIT paper last year that appeared in Cell, where they discovered new classes of antibiotics using graph neural networks. Now, before I finish, I would like to show maybe a slightly exotic application, but it still relates to this field of graph uh, uh, neural networks and, and uh, drug discovery. And here with my colleagues at Imperial College, we look at uh, uh, discovering drug-like molecules in food. So you may know that plant-based food in particular are rich in compounds that belong to the same chemical classes as anti-cancer drugs. And every bite of food that we put in our mouth comes with hundreds of bioactive molecules, most of which remain uh, largely unexplored by experts and not tracked by regulators. So I don't know how many of you have heard or counted the amount of polyphenols or flavonoids that, uh, that you've eaten today. So it's truly the dark matter of nutrition. So in, the, in our work, we're using graph neural networks to map different foods uh, based on uh, the anti-cancer drug -like 
molecules that they contain. And here you can see a map of about 250 different food ingredients uh, with some prominent champions that we call hyperfoods. And these are actually boring and simple foods that, such as tea or citruses or cabbage that uh, is probably worthwhile to add to our diet. And of course, the beauty of this kind of machine learning approach is that they are data driven. So we can find different foods for different uh, kinds of uh, diseases. And maybe the coolest part of this project was that the ingredients we identified were used by the famous Italian chef, Bruno Barbieri, to present uh, short recipes for Christmas. And if you wonder why he's in bed in this video, this is part of uh, Vodafone uh, Foundation Citizen Science campaign called Dream Lab. And we collaborate with, we collaborated with Vodafone to use the power of smartphones at night uh, to make our computations on a kind of big distributed uh, computer. So I think uh, it's a good moment to end on this tasty note. And um, I hope to have convinced you that geometric deep learning is uh, uh, interesting. It opens uh, a zoo uh, of different applications. And I will conclude with a quote from uh, Claude Dian Elvetius that said that the knowledge of certain principles uh, easily compensates for the lack of knowledge of certain facts. And I think this is our common uh, guidance for the development of uh, geometric deep learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your zoo of applications. Thank you for your fantastic presentation. And we hope that your experience will be useful for many of us. We've got several questions from our viewers that are coming right now. May I ask you just one? I uh, yeah. think that is very w vital right now, uh, especially in uh, terms of pandemic. It's about drug and medical substances. So uh, machine learning has wide application in drug development. Which areas of creation new medical substances are not yet affected by AI and in which the AI is widely used? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So uh, I think um, whatever comes to chemistry, where we can model, uh, where we have a good understanding of, of the systems, uh, like modeling molecules and molecule interactions, uh, for example, with proteins. So this is probably something that is already being done uh, relatively successfully. I think when you go to higher levels of uh, understanding biological systems, even interactions of different molecules, this is something that is uh, not so well modeled and not so well understood. And then, of course, when you go to even higher level, uh, for example, clinical trials. So this is probably where uh, the use of artificial intelligence systems uh, would make uh, the most uh, uh, dramatic improvement if it works. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you and hope to see you next year here in Moscow on this stage offline. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day.